My name is Lily Fuhr. I work here in Berlin for the Heinrich Böll Foundation, the Heinrich Böll Stiftung. Um, I'm also um, a, a board member of the Etc. Group, an organization that will play a role here as well. And I'll be moderating a discussion between our two panelists here and later in a session also with you. It's a one hour session, so we don't have a lot of time. And this session is, um, I think, very much at the heart of the bridge building um, mission of this Bits and Bäume conference. And we're building it um, on an essay, um, a little publication, a little booklet that we also brought with us that we um, want you to take home as well, if you don't have it yet, that is called Efficiency at Madness, that we at the Heinrich Böll Foundation did together with the Tactical um, Tech um, Collective a little while ago. And um, basically this is an ongoing conversation between different movements and group and activists on the question of how we deal with big, disruptive, risky, scary, <laughs> emerging new future technologies, most of them digitally enhanced and data driven and different ways of approaching that. And to give you a flavor of what this is about, I'll just very briefly read the few first few sentences of this essay to also explain the efficiency and madness bit. Um, Technology help us do more with less. They defy boundaries of space, time and self. They are an essential part of our daily lives and they can be crucial in finding solutions to seemingly in intractable problems. More recently, data-driven technologies from social media to smart cities have become an intrinsic part of the way we live. We experience them as both magic and loss. That is, they are simultaneously incredible and devastating in the ways they change our lives. Informing our immediate environment, changing ourselves, our relationships with each other, and transforming the ways industries and institutions work. More than being good or bad, these changes are simply paradigm shifting. So, that's our starting point for this conversation this morning. <laughs> that has been going on for a while and will continue after the session. Um, so, we'll be um, exploring common challenges, ways of addressing this problem of technologies and techno fixes, some differences as well, um, and sort of ways of how we can take this forward. Is there a way that we can collectively come up with this in, in informed civil society critique of these technologies that is not dystopian or utopian, but basically sort of firmly based on some very fundamental principles of human rights, planetary boundaries, um, democratic principles, etc. So what's that informed critique of civil society and what is, what are the strategies um, of, of implementing that and taking that forward? Um, and the way that we um, have envisaged this session, there's going to be no PowerPoint presentation or anything like that. <laughs> Marek Tuszynski, who I will introduce in a second, uh, more will um, briefly introduce some of the, the, the ideas behind the essay um, and, and, and the talk it, topic, and um, our second speaker, Pat, will react to it. Um, I will moderate a little bit of a discussion between the two of them to tease out some of the common threats and, um, and differences and ideas, and then we'll open it up to you to engage and contribute and ask questions. So that's the general outline, and now, um, to our two speakers. So Marek is the co-founder and, and creative director of, uh, the, of Tactical Tech or Technical, Tactical Technology Collective, a non-profit based here in Berlin. Um, and um, Tactical Tech works basically at the intersection of technology, human rights and civil liberties, which is, I think, very relevant for the context and framing of this Bits and Bäume conference. And you might have come across them through um, their the work on digital security and training that they give to activists, or their research on these questions, but also their cultural interventions. Um, so Marek will be speaking first, and, um, and then Pat Mooney will react to it. Pat Mooney is um, from Canada. He's the founder of the um, Etc. Group, or ETC Group, the Action Group on Erosion, Technology and Concentration. Pat just only recently stepped down as a director um, of ETC Group, but is still very much involved with them. <laughs> and uh, the ETC Group is basically looking at similar questions, but from a slightly different perspective. 
its Sveta group is very much um, sort of embedded in movements and civil society groups looking at the social, economic and ecological implications of technologies and how they change the lives of vulnerable people and poor communities, how they change our ecosystems and food systems, looking at the ways that we need to regulate them through UN institutions or at the national level, what kind of technology assessment is needed for these technologies. So, um, this is why I'm personally very excited to finally have the, these two groups and perspectives in one room for a conversation. I've been trying to, I've been wanting to have this conversation in person for a long time. Um, so, personally very excited about it, and with that, I will hand it to Marek to introduce the topic. Uh, thank you, Lily, first of all. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here in the Technical University. Uh, I'm super excited being on, the, on this stage with uh, Lily and Pat. I'm not an academic or scientist, and I'm not a technician, so I'm always... Uh, surprised that I'm invited to places like uh, universities and so forth, and I sometimes suspect in my... Uh, I suspect that uh, maybe there's a mistake, but uh, hopefully it won't be. Um, what I will do, and uh, Pat made a very nice comment, that uh, we're not going to use any visuals, we're not going to use PowerPoint, because we don't have any power and we're not going to make any point uh, by the end of the day. I would like to guide you through some uh, examples that we encounter in our work, then I would extrapolate from these examples a little bit, bring some context, and then ask some questions in probably five to seven minutes. Um, so I will ask you to use your imagination as a first tool. Uh, I will drop some names and some descriptions, and you can use your devices as a second instance if you can use your imagination because you didn't have coffee yet. Uh, to, uh, you feel free to use your mobile phone or tablet, phablet or whatever else you're carrying uh, to search for these things. Um, uh, everything I'm going to talk about actually exists. Um, so I think, because I found it on the internet. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so first imagine that you're going to a, to a bank and, uh, and uh, what you find really annoying is probably remembering or the you know, codes, the PIN number, etc. The other annoying thing is that you have to carry a plastic card that can be stolen and so forth. So imagine you're going to a bank and you don't have to carry anything. The ATM, the bank machine, recognizes you and you can uh, withdraw money. But also imagine that, forget the ATM, why bother? Why don't you go to a shop and do shopping and don't look for your wallet, plastic or non-plastic uh, kind of a system that you're using for pay for things. and. Uh, it is paying by recognizing you and so forth. And that sounds like a very nice system. And it's being experimented on right now in a place uh, called Jordan. Jordan has a third of the population are refugees coming from three different conflicts, from Palestine, from Iraq, and from Syria. And since 2013, a huge UN agency, UNCHR, is experimenting with uh, iris scanning, where all the refugees, and uh, last time I looked at the data, and you can look at it, the system is called Iris Guard, uh, UNCHR. You can also find very easily, and if you combine this with iris scanning, you will get the device. Um, they scan irises of 1.6 million refugees, and now probably it's over 2 million, uh, who then can access aid, which is monetary support, through iris scanning. And they scan everybody in the family, children, adults, elderly people, etc. And you go to the shop, you buy things, and then you pay through iris scanning, etc. And there's a great example here of uh, efficiency, transparency, and accountability on behalf of the large aid agency. And I just stop this example here. We'll come back to it in a second. A second uh, situation, imagine that you have to take care of somebody that is incapable of taking care of themselves. Um, that may be your grandmother, grandfather, or somebody in the family. And you are far away. And you really want to be helpful. You want to know if something is happening to them. They're losing memory. They are less and less mobile. And they're forgetting things and so forth. So you go to a shop and you buy a device. Uh, and you can buy this device, it is called Mother Sense, which is a small Internet of Things device that looks like a Russian doll, except it's all white and you can open it whatsoever. Uh, and it has attached to it a number of sensors. And you can put the sensors in different places, like a toothbrush, a, a medicine compartment, or bed. And then you can monitor how the elderly person is doing. 
Do they get up in the morning? Did they went for a walk? Did they take the medicine, etc., and so forth? And it's an interesting system here where you have three different operators. The person that needs help that may or may not agree on being monitored in such a way. The person that needs to monitor that person for helping them that then run a dashboard and can accumulate all the information about their behavior. And the third party, which is the maker of the system that accumulates all the data and information and so forth. And I stop it here. It costs about $122, I think, now, on Amazon or other internet shops. Um, the third example I wanted to, to give you this morning is, uh, is contraception. But not contraception as we think here in Berlin and other places that we often travel to, etc., but in places where there is a so-called population problem. And imagine that you had a, a chip of the size of a fingernail that is very thin, that you can insert under skin and it will release uh, medicine or other hormones that would enable you to control your uh, uh, fertility. And such a thing uh, doesn't exist per se, it's been funded and is in process of testing, we don't know, it's supposed to be on the market this year, funded by the Gates Foundation, and it's called Fertility Chip. And the idea here is that it would enable women in developing countries to control their fertility for 16 years, that's how long it lasts, remotely. Right? So we have these three different cases here. The iris scanner is an interesting case because you have aid agency collaborating with the private sector. Uh, the company is uh, British uh, Jordanian, uh, the two board members of this company, Iris Scanner, uh, are coming from the military and security sector, from MI6 and from uh, Defense US. The both board members were supporters of the war in Iraq, and some of them even had a case in a, in a criminal court accused of uh, participation in some uh, war atrocities. Um, on the one hand, you have the agency that is dealing with a hard problem, which is how we can help millions of people that uh, are losing their rights and identity. And they defend themselves that they need to do that for better uh, transparency and accountability. So how much money they spend on what, they can monitor who is uh, withdrawing them, how they spend them, etc. That enables the system to be better and better and, and so forth. And it operates at large scale. And also they say that um, they only operate under informed consent. So all the people who irises are scan are uh, supposed to agree on that scanning. Obviously, if you are a refugee in, in places like Jordan, you have no choice. Either you join the system or you don't. There's, there's no consent whatsoever. And if you don't even sign anything, they just go into the system. And they fantasize now, the company, that there's a 2.5 billion people that have no access to financial services and the system is fantastic. They now join Goldman uh, Sachs and they experimenting with blockchain. It's kind of, you know, either broader empowering the system, etc. The, the mother sense example is very interesting because that's more our fascination, our personal need to solve a problem that we see it individually, that we see that we have to take care of somebody that we actually do care about. But we don't see it as a part of a larger problem of uh, aging population or the fact that there's a other set of problems that we're not addressing by a solution that is uh, personal surveillance. Imagine the same system can be used for uh, surveying your spouse or surveying uh, your children and so forth, etc. And if you zoom out, uh, you probably are used to zooming out using Google Maps, uh, zoom out from the problem to you can see that if you own the system, you have much broader understanding of certain sectors of population and their behavior. And on the basis of that, you can uh, define their access to things like further help, education, insurance, and so forth, etc. And the third example I brought, which is the chip, fertility chip from the Gates Foundation and so forth, is an example where certain ideology of quantifying everything is uh, becoming a solution to all of all possible problems. It doesn't take into consideration the fact that position of women in, in certain societies and places is disempowered to its maximum and so forth. They won't be the people controlling the remote control, controlling their fertility in the first place. And it's not necessarily a solution to the problem that we're looking at. Um, and these three examples lead me to two things I wanted to share with you, or maybe three this morning. One is that it is not a new situation uh, where we're mistaking something that is precision with something that is accuracy. There is a, imagine an object that looks like a toaster. 
and it actually looks like a toaster. And it's called uh, Antikythera. It's an object that has been found under sea in one of the ships that uh, went down at some point uh, 200 years BC that has amazing uh, mechanism of about 35 dials, very precisely carved. And it's an uh, oddball. It's like an unusual object. We don't know anything like this in the, in the antiquity. The things were much less precise. And after some analysis and looking at it, it came to the fore that actually this object was used for navigation. And it was able to predict a constellation between moon and sun and five then known planets. The problem is that the precision of the instrument that was absolutely outstanding, had nothing to do with the accuracy of the instrument. It was throwing wrong results because of the underlying astronomy that was used to define the objects in the first place. And I just wanted to kind of use that as an example for, imagine if you are 2,000 years ahead and somebody finds the, the best computer we have right now and try to run it and figure out what we were trying to solve and what kind of uh, input was used to create that machinery in the first place, right? And that leads me to two kind of, uh, and that's going to be the end of what I'm talking about here, and I'll pass to Pat, um, two historical moments that are very important also from the point of view of the efficiency and madness that we've been uh, writing together with Steph. Uh, so one is obviously the, the cybernetics. <clears throat> cybernetics is a specific way of thinking about the world. So it's underlined by three, I would say, important notions of one, that we're living in a complex systems, and these systems are somehow uh, rational. So there's some logic in the systems that we, if we only have enough information about the systems and there's a constellation between biological, non-biological, technical, non-technical, predictable, unpredictable, we will be able to compute them to create a model of them. That's, a, that's a one principle of cyber cybernetics. The second is that the systems are correlated through the small bits of information and they only s signals. So if we're able to gather all these signals and uh, put them into a machine that we designed, like a computer, for example, we are also able to control them. We're able to understand them and so forth. And the third, third principle is, if we have these two things and we're able, we have the capacity and so forth, regardless of all this randomness and complexity of the systems, we are also able to predict them. And prediction becomes a big thing. Uh, cybernetics comes from the military. Uh, it was necessary for predicting operations and actions of the enemy and so forth. Uh, and there were always problems of resources. So uh, cybernetics was used for predicting uh, how you know the military operates and so forth. Um, and the second historical moment that is defining the kind of a digital reality and quantification that we're living right now and this kind of a way of thinking about our, our world, if you like, the planet Earth and so forth, is a debate between, uh, and that's, I'm borrowing that from Felix Stadler from his lecture here at HKV uh, this year, a uh, debate between Boyle and Hobbes. That's, we're talking about, uh, I think, 17th century. No, actually 18th century. 17th century was the other thing I wanted to tell you about. So um, the, the debate was, uh, what is knowledge, basically? And uh, on, on Boyle's side, knowledge was something that is neutral, that if you have a decent group of people and they discuss a problem, they ask questions, they find evidence, they can come up with, with solutions to problems. And that led to distinction between different uh, elements of our society. So this is the time where power is separated from church, separated from science, and so forth. In each group, respectively, we can and debate different ideas, bring different forms of evidence, and come with different conclusions. While Hobbes, uh, that got no traction at the time in the debate, proposed something very different, that knowledge is always political, with no exceptions. And it seems to me like we are coming back to this moment where uh, with the power structures, with the certain dominance of certain businesses, specifically data-driven, we kind of going back to the conclusion where actually knowledge is, uh, is power and is political, uh, where we see who are those who are able to accumulate bits of information, data and evidence, and then turn it or not to different forms of knowledge and distribute uh, accordingly. At the same time, these powers are totally in capacity to throw out a lot of randomness to the world that we as individuals have to live and deal with proxy problems very often, or problems that are important to us individually, but remove us from looking at problems that are global, you know, planetary scale and very complex and so forth. So this is the kind of a, a short verbal audio essay I wanted to share with you this morning. 
before my first coffee. So I probably pass it now to Pat to to see how he will respond to that. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Just yeah, you can get up. Thank you, Marek. And maybe we can already stand here to keep it dynamic, so you just stay with us and Pat, you can get up. And um, um, I'll invite you exactly to react to that. And I'd be interested specifically for you to, to react to some of the themes that Marek brought up, um, including precision, quantification, and how that relates to worldviews and ways of knowing, and also the theme of accountability um, and the kind of players we're looking at, um, corporate, government, governments, military, etc. Okay, thank you. Uh, wow. The, um, the, um, he was supposed to do the efficiency part of the presentation, and I was to do the madness part of the presentation. But I think you just got the madness, uh, not of his madness, but the madness of, of the world we're in. Um, the, I, I think we should address perhaps those, those uh, what does this mean in wider dimensions as well. Uh, the world that I look at is one which, and most of my work is around agriculture, so I'll try to, well, it's not exclusively that, I'll try to look at how this digital world now is, is impacting our food supply, our food systems, and how it may well impact them in the future, and who is in control of that, because that's what finally it comes down to, I think, uh, who, will, who will be responsible for our survival in food in the, in the decades ahead. It's. Um, uh, and it's a world where the efficiencies um, can seem terrific and tremendously excellent, and then the realities are just completely different from that. We've seen a world now where, because of digital information, uh, we, there is no longer a real distinction between um, moving um, data about uh, transportation, communications, in normally conceived information around, and the information related to biology. So as much as you can have digital computers, you can also have digital DNA. And the ability to now to, to adjust DNA to the specifications of an industrial system is so far beyond biotechnology that, it's, that it's, uh, it has to have its own terms. It's now called gene drives and synthetic biology, but it's a capacity now to simply look at the DNA of life of any species and edit that DNA, not only just edit the DNA, but turn that DNA um, into a drive, which you can force then a characteristic that you've created through an entire species so that you can make um, a recessive gene dominant. You can make something, you can create sterility in a species uh, very rapidly because of these abilities to make changes. So it's not just a digitization of, of, uh, our, our, of our personal information, it's a digitization of, of our own personal DNA and everybody else's, everything else's. It's also a world in which then because of the, that, those transformations, we can't be sure who will finally control this. We find ourselves in a place where we were talking the last two years about how Bayer was going to take over Monsanto and Syngenta was going to be bought by ChemChina and Dow and DuPont were going to merge and so the beginnings of our food supply, the seeds and the pesticides of our food supply were going to be controlled by basically three enterprises. And that seemed to be alarming, that kind of concentration driven, as the companies themselves said, driven by their desire to control the technologies and the digital information. That was the cause of the mergers. But then we find that it's not just that. Because of that same digital information, Amazon buys Whole Foods, the world's largest uh, 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 organic food retailing company in the, based in the United States. And Amazon moves into providing food uh, in the same way buying grocery chains in China and in New Zealand. And we don't know where else after this, because Amazon is now becoming a food company. Or that suddenly Microsoft, uh, which we think of as being almost old these days, as a company that, that has moved in to work with uh, uh, one of the world's major breweries in Denmark, uh, to uh, not only help them developing new hops and new yeasts for the brewery system, but developing entire new crops. And then re recognize that because of their capacity working with Carlsberg, they can actually move out and give advice to farmers in Europe on how, what, on how to do plant breeding. 
So suddenly Microsoft becomes a plant breeder. Or looking at the changes taking place with um, um, uh, companies like uh, 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 KFC, the, do you call it KFC here or Kentucky Fried Chicken? KFC. KFC is very proud of the fact that they, are, they, they now have a digitized process to monitor uh, their production lines so they can use a blockchain to track all of the sources of their, their inputs, the chickens and the potatoes and so on, and there are not many things in Kentucky Fried Chicken, and, and uh, get them to their stores. And to, to advertise their brilliance at their efficiencies, they actually shot a, a, a bucket of chicken into space. They blasted the chicken into space. Um, that's high tech, apparently. Uh, at the same time, almost in the same month, KFC wasn't able to get chickens to its shops in the UK. They set up a transport, uh, the blockchain set up a mechanism that simply did not work, and most of the shops in the UK selling KFC chicken had no chickens. So they could put it into space, but they couldn't put it into the store across the street. And we have this same thing as with, um, in terms of the efficiencies with uh, companies like um, Walmart the world's biggest food retailer, Walmart claims that because of their efficiencies now, they can take blockchains and track 30 different products from farms scattered throughout Latin America all the way to the grocery store in the United States or Europe. Uh, but Walmart couldn't find out what happened to its goats that it bought in New Zealand, shipping them to the United States, that all died on board the ship because they couldn't control the heat in the ship. So the efficiency works sometimes, but not other times. And uh, Tesco in the UK has, again, blockchains and all of the digital efficiencies and all the information it needs to track all of its products. But it made two small mistakes last year. One of them was that they didn't realize in tracking their products that the migrant African workers in Italy were dying in the field because of heat prostration and because they weren't allowed to go to get medical help. That wasn't recorded on the blockchain. And it wasn't recorded on the blockchain for Tesco that when they showed the pictures of farms above their products in the UK, that you could see that's the farm that our product came from, those farms don't actually exist. They're just photographs of random farms, had nothing to do with the products. So while well, the blockchain seemed to prove that efficiency, the reality was again totally different. But now we're also in a world where we can again, Peruvian farmers are being told that they can protect their land rights from land grabs if they again put their digital information about their land on the internet so that the ownership of their land is clearly defined and identified and proven by a blockchain again to show that that's theirs. No one can take it from them. Except that when they do that, by the thousands in Peru, it means that someone at a computer terminal in New York at Goldman Sachs can suddenly recognize that they can commodify all of that land that they can see the ownership as well and they can choose to pick and choose and buy and make deals from their computers in New York, which they could never do before. So the efficiency of the legal right of the farmer is protected in Peru to be taken away by the stockbroker in New York. And this is the same way that that is changing for us in the food system. We're also finding that, that size is no longer important. About 70% of our food supply comes from peasants around the world. 70% of the world's people are fed by peasants. They're outside of the normal market system until now with the digital system because their land can now be controlled as in Peru. But also worse than that now, size doesn't count because companies don't really care if you have a small plot of land or a large plot of land. They're developing farm machinery, which is tested now, where they can disaggregate the farm equipment. So it can either plant or plow or harvest hundreds of hectares at a time, or break up into pieces and do 30 or 40 different plots of land. 
at the same time and then come back together again. So size is no longer important. And now already one third of the rice land in a country like Japan is actually monitored by these kinds of robots or by, by drones that can do the seeding and, and, this, and the spraying for pesticides and so on. So no longer is the peasant isolated from the market. They're trapped into a market system where the company doesn't give a damn how big you are or who you are or even if you exist, it can manage any scale. And that's a change of our food supply which means at the end of the day, and I'll stop with this, at the end of the day in this system, and I'm only talking about the food system here, we're moving towards a world where it's as easy for Nestle's as it is for what used to be Monsanto, Bayer now, or Cargill or John Deere to control the food supply as anybody else, or Amazon or Microsoft. And where we once debated whether it was safe or not to have three seed companies control the world's food seed supply, the question now is, and they will argue this, is that, well, don't worry, we still have four companies controlling the food system of the planet. And that will be possible. And where that company again will be, John Deere or Amazon or Bayer, we have no idea. Thank you, Pat. <laughs> so. I don't know how you feel on a Sunday morning like this. Um, it makes me scared, angry, helpless. <laughs> um, so I want to just before I open for um, for you to also ask questions and, and, and make some comments. I want to go back to Marek and then also briefly to Pat to maybe get us out of that despair situation a little bit and say so. Looking at the world we're living in, um, where technology-driven corporate concentration and maybe government and military-driven surveillance is increasing, and where big data politics are taking over our food chains or bodies or minds, so what are the what are our collective strategies? So what, what do we do with that? What, what's because I know that tactical tech and, and etc. group are very different, but maybe potentially sort of complementary approaches to looking at a problem and you're both not very, you don't seem very depressed and you, you know, you worry. <laughs> there must be hope, to, so there is something that we can do. So I want to just tease that out a little bit, what do you think with civil society strategies um, in light of these mega trends and, and scary things could look like? Thanks, that's, uh, not, a, that's not an easy question to answer. Um, so I just want to say some practical things from the work we do. I think it's uh, it's extremely important in, in the work we do to stay alert and uh, on the top of things as they evolving and revolving in front of our eyes and address them as they come. And that is uh, the reason that we work with a lot of activist groups or in other ways politically engaged citizens who not necessarily define activism as a, as, a, as a form of a protest or standing up to power, etc., but also would rather investigate and build knowledge bases and understanding of the world themselves to be able to then engage in a, in a, in a conversation. So that one thing is to kind of stay, stay alert and educate yourself. If you're coming from where I'm coming from, we used to be across the wall actually from here, but I'm from the other country um, where I grew up, where access to knowledge was restricted, censored and controlled. Um, the only solution we had that we didn't want to comply with that was to educate ourselves. And that's what we do. We, we, we see ourselves as a kind of an outfit that is bringing different forms of information, knowledge and understanding. The second, I think, is a much bigger question, which is like how you address the, the, the kind of a mindsets and ideologies and political powers behind the problems that we're looking at. And for that, I think, it's necessary to rethink how we think about the world and start asking different questions that are not about efficiency, it's not about accuracy, it's not about information as a driving force of understanding the world, but trying to figure out are there any other mechanisms that we lost in the way, uh, why we dive so deeply into cybernetic kind of a way of thinking about the world. And it's also part of education, but I I wouldn't say it's about literacy or literacy, that's a very patronizing way of seeing the world. I think we, we are all literate as much as we can. And, uh, and we have constraints that are coming from where we are from and uh, what we allow to do and how we allow to do that and so forth. And we as we are here in the room are extremely privileged. And I think we should use this privilege uh, uh, to be more critical about the world and what we're doing in the world ourselves. So that's kind of, I'm going to, dramatic now. 
Well, I mean, one of the things that we've learned, and I am optimistic, it, it's, a, it's a genetic defect, I'm sure, that can be cured. But, uh, or driven. Or driven, yes, <laughs> well, maybe driven. <laughs> uh, is, is, uh, I've learned at this conference already is, is that uh, certainly a center group needs these guys. We need to work together with technical tactics. We, uh, uh, you have things and knowledge that we don't have, and, and maybe a little bit of the other way around. I'm not so sure, <laughs> but, but uh, we need a wider collaboration. Um, I was saying to, last night in another meeting that, that um, uh, in a center group, we spent 40 years chasing ambulances. Uh, one technology after another, as they come, as they appear on the horizon and drive by, and we rush, rush after them, trying to solve problems that they create, and uh, we, we have to stop doing that. So those of us who are working on energy systems, those who are working on mining, those who are working uh, with uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, we're dealing with human rights issues. We're all faced with technological questions about those rights and those issues and we need to find ways to collaborate more closely. Uh, we need, instead of chasing ambulances, we need to have a capacity in civil society to assess technologies in our communities, at the national level, at the regional level, and at the global level to say, okay, this, this is what's coming down the horizon. These are the new things. Geoengineering, for example, if you want to have a really bad day, we can tell you about geoengineering. Uh, that that's, these things are coming and we need to now figure out how to address them. And knowing that they're coming, we can address them as possible. And the systems that we're, a channel, we're, we're being confronted by are the same. They are big data technologies. So that's the platform we have to deal with, whatever the specific issue is. And we need to have citizen-based assessments of these technologies. And then I think we do need to go beyond citizen-based, but have the citizen-based inf information get to national governments to change national government views on technologies. And also, in, I think I would argue, place that at the United Nations level as well. Let's start. Thank you. So um, looking at the time, I really want to make sure we have enough time for you to engage in this discussion. So we've opened it up, addressed quite a number of issues. Um, now is the time for you to um, ask questions, make short comments, contributions. Um, so if you can, there's a, a microphone that Ricardo has here, so if you can raise your hand and then we'll maybe um, collect, maybe one, yeah, I saw two here in the front and then in the back. And um, please very briefly say who you are and then what you have to say. Hi, uh, my name is Sebastian. Um, I work in science communication, if that's relevant. Um, I wanted to, to ask to you two, what's the, what would the issue of the narratives? And what I mean is that in a little bit implicit or more like explicit in what you said is the fact that there seems to be a double narrative. Like we are told that these, I don't know, these things are done in, uh, for efficiency, for progress, for the well-being of everybody. But clearly they're just looking, the, the corporations are looking for a bottom line. They're, I don't know. Um, the governments make decisions that are not really for the well-being of everybody. So what is the, the way of dealing, uh, continuing with this question of how can we see what, what's possible to do when it comes to unveiling these false narratives? You know, what are your thoughts on that? Okay, let's take um, the question in the back. So I'm, I'm just in the very back, sorry. And then can those who want to speak just raise your hands slightly bit higher so I can see? Hi, my name is Paolo. I write about arts and politics and uh, cultures of resistance. Um, when I walk in this building this morning, there's an image of one of the celebrated um, scientists, uh, Konrad Zuse, uh, on, the, on the wall when I come into the building of Te U. And uh, Konrad Zuse created the, the first uh, programmable computer. And he's still celebrated as an incredible pioneer. Um, but he was also building guided missile systems for, for the Third Reich. And I find it also very difficult to find when is it, um, where is the line where uh, you are working with or encouraging people to work in projects that are really techno-fascism. And, um, you know, then it comes up, if I bring it up to speed now, somebody like Steve Wozniak uh, helped build Apple computers. 
uh, are these people today participating in techno fascism and how do we how do we uh, address the people who are participating in the development of technologies that are being used in in these systems of techno fascism are you fine with me taking one more question is that sure. yeah just is there any woman who wants to speak sorry i'm just only seeing men raising their hand okay here in the front thank you sorry I'll remember you other guys. Ah. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Albina. I study computer science and environmental governance. Um, my question is more towards the food supply and demand um, aspect. So with the Green Revolution, it was very clear where we're going in terms of mechanization, improve the production to feed the people in the world. Um, use of pesticides and so on. Um, however, today, as far as scientists keep telling us, this is not any more sustainable because with the climate change we can't really predict how much food we can still produce. So um, my question is, do we have a certain, um, a certain so, so to say, topic of those four <laughs> companies that they are driving for. What is the goal? Do they do they have an approach of how they want to solve the problem of feeding people and at the same time not running into the dead end with um, soil degradation and climate change? Thank you. Thank you. So I'll hand it back to the two speakers. I'll ask you to be um, fairly precise and short, um, efficient and mad at the same time. Um, so we can do one other round. Pat, do you want to start? Okay, well, um, I'll leave the narrative for a moment, but th in the second question about uh, fighting fascism, um, I don't think there's any plowshare that can't be turned into a sword. And so sometimes it's only a matter of time. If you look at any technology, um, how could it be perverted? Uh, so the, the, the best wishes of the inventor, and I'm not suggesting they all had good wishes or good intentions, but can be turned into something else. And we could probably go through a long listing of plow, what were perceived at one time to be plowshares that ultimately became swords uh, used against societies. They don't have to be that way, but, but that's the reality. Trying to fix a particular point where you say, aha, that's where fascism begins, I think is hard to do. Uh, on the question of, of, the, of the, 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 the aspirations of the, of, uh, the food system and the Green Revolution, can I slightly change that? Because I think, in every, I'll have to say this quickly, but if, whether you go from Linnaeus to Mendel to uh, hybridization to, to the Green Revolution to the, the um, um, uh, fertilization, nitrogen fertilization technologies, um, in every case, what we had was a dumbing down of the food system, where an idea of, its, of itself, which was not necessarily bad, of itself, was put into a social context where it became bad, where it actually, again, reduced diversity, reduced uh, the innovative capacity of peasants to, to actually grow food. The alternative for us now, the companies are saying, of course, sorry, the companies are saying, that in order to, to feed ourselves in the year 2050, much less 2100, we have to have climate smart agriculture. And that means all these precision systems, it means that they must be allowed to become as big as they want to be to take over as much of the food supply as possible. The alternative is, is and I'll summarize it quickly, the alternative is to actually work with the creative diversity of the 350 million farms out there and the farmers and farm families out in the world who actually are producing the food and recognize that they are researchers and innovators doing creative things and how to facilitate their work to respond more rapidly to climate change. And perhaps if I can give you a couple of figures. One is that the entire industrial food chain spends 45% of its research budget on one crop, corn or maize. So with climate change, unless you want to eat popcorn, uh, you're really left with, you, know, you, you have to get rid of those companies because we cannot have a world in which 45% of the research goes on one dumb crop. When there's 7,000 crops out there we could be using. And farmers work with 7,000 crops. Companies work with almost no diversity of any kind, and their actual creativity and innovative capacity has been declining since the 1990s. They do less creativity, less innovation now than they used to. 
Because why bother innovating when you have a monopoly? Why spend the money on that? Farmers, meanwhile, are working with 7,000 different crop species. They're working with two and a half million uh, different crop varieties. Uh, they're creative and innovative in developing those things, those varieties. And we need to be using that to respond to climate change and to making sure we have food on the table in 2050. I'm very optimistic that the world can feed itself. Very optimistic about that. But I, I, we can't do it if we rely upon a, a highly concentrated food system. Thank you for these three questions, and uh, also thank you. Uh, I always like uh, meetings where Paolo is present with his extraterrestrials and uh, activism because he always asks very critical, however often phrased in a very radical way, questions that are very important. And I also like it when I'm on the stage, I have to answer them. Um, Technofascism is a, is a very important uh, phrasing. I would kind of unpack it in a different way, and uh, you allowed me, Paolo, to do that. That technology is often seen and sold to us, and also technical solution, technological solution, data solution, as neutral solutions in some or another way. So technology is never neutral. Uh, but also, the problem we have right now, that is not always only good, not always only bad. It all depends of who and how is using technology, or technology uh, enhanced by data. And unfortunately, when you have situations where that is uh, mono monopolized, ag aggregated by certain entities, that becomes extremely problematic. And often leads to totalitarian use of technology and control, and that's where Paolo is referring to uh, technofascism in some other way, when the link between military and, and, and power is very, very strong, and the development of technology is the development of this idea of total information control. And we've seen that being deployed in, in places uh, all over the world, from Singapore to China to uh, to US and so forth, etc., where surveillance is a dominating form of uh, controlling, and it's all in the name of the security, etc., and so forth. If this fascism, there's a different story. Fascism is not uh, something that all of this t kind of semi-totalitarian systems would go for. And fascism is about killing people. It's a racist way of exterminating people that are not like us. And that's a very radical form of totalitarianism, I would say. But I would draw from that one conclusion that we have to be careful where we think that technology is neutral. It never is. And, uh, uh, and that's, I think, the main uh, thing. But the question about the inability for certain powers and structures like government, the question you ask about why is it that easy to you know, not understand the systems, is that not only the people in power in parliaments and other places, regulatory uh, bodies, etc., have problem with uh, frameworks and methodologies that they use. We often use methodologies and frameworks and ideas like privacy that do not necessarily apply easily to how technology is defining society or, or politics nowadays, if you like, or power for that matter. And a lot of uh, these institutions are driven by certain bureaucratic processes that are incapable of following something that is developing much faster in parallel. And it's interesting that you can make a lot of parallels between Facebook, for example, nowadays and the whole crisis with how they behave, how they abuse the users, etc., and so forth, to what was happening before with tobacco industry or oil industry and so forth, etc. The problem is that these old corporations were easier to control in time uh, by existing frameworks. And Facebook is capable of doing that because there's no framework developed by us to be able to time them quickly enough so the damage is not massive. And the damage is really, really big now, uh, what they do to politics and so forth, etc. So I don't have an answer to that question. I think it's again, uh, uh, is about education and understanding, but also f f kind of foreseeing where these developments are leading us to and stopping them at a time where it's still possible. Uh. Thank you. Let's do one very quick round of last questions. So you've been wanting to speak for a long time and then here in the front, um, and then, yeah, very quick answers. Thank you so much. Um, I'm into compost and low-tech. I'm based in Berlin. My name is Joachim. My favorite actions are the interactions, and there's a small example. There's a superfood, it's called water. We drink it every day, and it's the source of life. So thanks a lot for your um, presentation. I would um, favor showcasing alternatives. You can um, refill this source of life called water for free here in the building. There are toilets. You can also wash, their hands, wash your hands there and help 
um, at the kitchen. You can buy water for 30 cents and you can also um, fill water, design it nicely and sell it for five euros a liter. It's all possible, so it's all alternatives. And there's an experiment for everyone. Ask people to refill your water. I think this is a very nice um, bottom-up Thank you. Can you activism. just make it Yes, that quick. was it. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that comment. So I'll go over here. Thank you. Um, yeah, hi, I'm Julia. I'm currently working with Fian. And my question is particularly to Pat, because you talked about how um, these issues should also be um, brought to the United Nations. And now, like, currently there's a debate, what what should we do? Because currently we're actually observing that the human rights architecture is really crumbling. And so what is your opinion on that? Is there, like, how should we approach this now? Thank you. Okay, and before I hand back um, to the two of you, I also want to add one question for a final round of answers. I know that both Etc. Group and the Tactical Tech Collective do a lot of horizon scanning of uh, things that we collectively need to worry about. So what's next? What's ahead? Um, these predictions um, tend to be true in many, many cases, which makes them very scary. So I'm curious if there's or there were like one or two trends or things that uh, you want to you want to mention in this final round something to keep in mind and worry about going forward. But I'll start with you, Pat, because there was also a specific question. Okay. Well, you're absolutely right, of course, that human rights is under threat, and, and uh, that's terrible, and it has to be challenged wherever we, where we find it. I do think that um, for all kinds of, of geopolitical reasons, the UN is an interesting place to try to introduce the concept of, for example, technology assessment as a, as a UN treaty. Um, uh, that sounds absurd if you think of a five-year time frame. It's not absurd if you think of a 15 or 10, 10 15 year time frame. Um, there's, there's lots of reasons why governments in the global south would want to have technology assessment. And, uh, and, and some in the north as well. There is a general nervousness and uncertainty about it uh, in, in societies, what's happening with technologies. This is the time to take advantage of that. By pushing an issue at the United Nations level, its real advantage is that it actually gets the attention of governments in the global south to say, well, we must do our own thing in our own countries and civil society there as well. But it has to be, ultimately, uh, anything that the UN does or national governments do will not be effective unless there is a capacity in civil society to monitor technologies and to make their own assessments. So the grassroots assessment is the, the highest priority. In terms of things that are coming, uh, just to make your day complete, um, I think the, mo the greatest concern I have uh, is not artificial intelligence. Um, it is uh, because of climate change, uh, governments do have a way out of this which is a temporary way out of this, which they will probably use and I'm alarmed about. It's called geoengineering. I mentioned it before. It is the idea that you can blow sulfates into the stratosphere to block uh, the, uh, the sun, which means that you can lower temperatures artificially for, um, by one or two degrees, perhaps even, and delay climate change, causing many other kinds of problems, but delaying some aspects of climate change. And because of governments being un afraid to take any other initiatives or unwilling to, and industry not willing to let them do that, what we're seeing in, in climate change negotiations now is the invasion of what was thought to be an absurdly stupid idea of controlling the thermostat of the planet that's now being turned into being, being, from being idiotic to being almost accepted by governments that that's where they're going to finally go. And that will mean turning over the control of the thermostat of the planet to one or two countries probably. So that's the, the technology concern I'm most concerned about. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'm going to answer this question about the prediction. So I don't do prediction. Uninterested, I'm incapable. I'm not, I'm not, I have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow uh, at all. Uh, I'm sorry about that. Um, so we work, like what you call the environment scanning is more about two things. So when you work with the organizations on the ground, we mostly come from the sector of human rights 
and um, justice broadly understood, etc. We look at what are the struggles that we are dealing with and what they have at hand, what resources they have that they can use. So that leads us often to going back to basics, to kind of you know the, the specific values of information and uh, uh, creating systems that are verifiable, trustable, and uh, enable people to move forward in understanding the environment in, the, in which they operate. On the other hand, we also work with a uh, we kind of a more Western public like yourselves, uh, as I can see, uh, that are the consumers and users of technology, that probably the way you use technology, mostly for entertainment and other things in principle, and the rest for, for work and other things and your activism. And for that, uh, we're looking at what questions you are asking, what is your understanding of what the devices, tools, technology, underlying platforms and systems are actually doing, what is your role in this constellation. And for that, we, we propose different alternative ways of seeing it, and you can see it here on the third floor, it's called the classroom experience, where we try to kind of you know make it into more tangible way uh, and more ambiguous way enabling the viewer and user to ask questions that otherwise it's very hard to ask because we're dealing with extreme you know complexity here thank you so we've come to an end but if you want more of this you can go to the classroom <laughs> experiences as Marek said or you can pick up one of the efficiency and madness essays we brought a box here that we're happy to distribute and then more in the classroom um, room thank you so much for being here We'll talk about some of this. I'm oh, sorry, there, there's also a session at 12 o'clock uh, on digital capitalism. I think it's in the plenary hall that we'll talk about some of these things at least. Not all. Thank you. Thank you, Marek. Thank you, Pat. Thank you to all of you.